love to communicate to music. I just started communicate with music to my kids. They don't listen to me talking anymore. I just use their songs and get my point across. You know, seriously, you should try it. It's awesome. They do listen. We're at the mall the other day. They're just begging me for an iPhone for an hour. I finally said, dude, I'm not going to buy you an iPhone because you asked for it like you need one. You don't. I'm not going to buy you an iPhone. You're insane if you think I'll pay for it. So be on your way. I'm not going to listen. Go away. You're wasting all your time. Here's the dime if you find a pay phone. But no iPhone today. And that's what I do. I had to write a Jason Mraz song the other day for my kids. Oh, I found something under your bed. I smelt it. An old bologna sandwich with some cheese that had melted. Fell right through the cracks. And it's getting funky bad. Go get a paper towel and some Febreze. Open up a window, man, that stinks. Get down on your knees and clean that rug, rug, rug. Oh, it's time to few Mugate your bedroom, boy. It cannot wait. Good Lord. Oh. What about John Mayer, man? He's going to have kids someday in the car. <laughs> I think he might write this song. You better quit all that complaining Don't want to hear another sound If I hear any more whining I'm gonna turn the car around You got a little television And you had enough to eat If you don't change your disposition I'm gonna leave you on the street So I'm waiting For your attitude to change I keep on waiting For your attitude to change Well, did that put you in the mood to speak about your darling little angels this morning? <laughs> I am super excited about the series that we're beginning this weekend called Raising Great Kids. And I want to tell you that uh, this uh, is really understanding biblical principles that will apply to you whether or not you have kids. All the biblical principles on any topic are transferable principles. And so, whether you have children, even if they're grown and gone, or if you do not have children, perhaps you'd like some someday or not, whatever, uh, it's applicable to both sides. So, for example, this series is important if you have children for two reasons. Now, hear me carefully on this. First of all, because your child's eternity is at stake. That's why. Uh, where our children spend eternity in, ver in a very real sense has to do with what kind of spiritual formation and spiritual care, along with all the other important stuff of life, we invested in them. I mean, if we allow them to, they'll become very entitled, very lazy, maybe rebellious, maybe addicted, maybe become an atheist. You say, I'm not making my kid an atheist. If we are not investing in them in a positive, proactive way to know and love God, yeah, we kind of are. Yeah, we kind of are. I'm going to make a bold statement, but I'm going to demonstrate biblically how, in fact, it is so. And it's this. Our children will become what we make them. You look around our culture, even our church family, and I did this as a young man. I was a father at 24, and I had been noticing before I became a dad, and especially after, uh, I started observing which teenagers were really cool kids balanced, fun, whole, great self-esteem, loved God, loved their family. What were these families, what were these parents doing that I could learn from? And that experience began for me in the mid-1980s, and I'm still today, just like you, growing and learning. So first of all, our kids' eternity is at stake. There's a second 
reason for those of you that have children. Our legacy, yours and mine, our legacy in this life is at stake. Imagine with me for just a moment you're on your deathbed. Uh, not to be morbid, but we're going to have that moment, all of us in our life. We're on our deathbed, and if we could have a do-over in life, it's not going to be that we kill one more business deal, that we make one last trip of our dreams. Our thoughts will be totally directed toward the people on the planet with our DNA that we are now leaving behind. And whether or not we ever see them again will be very much dependent on the kind of spiritual investment we made in them. And our legacy is wrapped up within them. And so if you have children, what we're going to learn this weekend and the next couple weekends is because your child's eternity is at stake. And as parents and adults, our legacy spiritually is at stake. Now, if you don't have children, here's your application. We're going to be building our understanding of raising great kids on this premise. We've got to learn to treat our children the way that God the Father treats us. We've got to learn to treat our kids, rear our children, invest in our children, love our children, discipline our children the same way that God the Father treats us and cares for us, right? So if you do not have children, I want you to watch very carefully how God wants us to parent because that is how God is parenting you. If you want to understand uh, how God the Father interacts with you as an adult person uh, because you are still his daughter, you are still his son if you've begun your relationship with Christ. And so all these principles that we're going to unpack, they are transferable principles with parallel application. Please remember that. Um, it'll be really helpful wherever you may find yourself at life uh, in the moment. Reach for your notes. These are gonna be really important for us as we go forward. There's also a digital version online uh, available each weekend. Now, true story. A guy was traveling around teaching a seminar on how to be a great parent. And I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but he kind of set himself up as a totally excellent parent, like, I am the man. Now, here's the problem. The guy was a single guy. He had no kids. I don't know why single people think they know so much, because one day, in terms of child rearing, we got, you know, no kids and five theories. You turn around twice, and you got five kids and no more theories. You know, that's just how life works. But anyhow, he started his parenting seminar, and this is the title he gave it when he first began to travel across the nation. He was actually a very gifted communicator. He called it the final authority on parenting. And that went well for a couple of years because, of course, he knew everything. And then something happened in the succeeding two or three years. He both got married and had a first baby. So it was kind of an adjustment for him, and he continued to travel, but he renamed his seminar. He now called it Some Suggestions to Parents. <laughs> Time passes, and something else happens. Two more kids are born to he and his wife. He is now calling uh, the seminar Feeble Hints to Fellow Strugglers. And the last anybody would heard of this dude, the title of his parenting seminar was, Anybody Here Have a Few Words of Wisdom? <laughs> See, that's what happens to us. Irma Bombeck, some of you that might be a little older, a little more seasoned in life, you may remember Irma. Irma, she had a very popular uh, syndicated columnist and so. And somebody asked her, her children were gone and grown and so, and they said, Irma, if you could live your life over, would you have kids? And she said, yes, absolutely, but just not the same ones. <laughs> okay, so the kids you now got, this is not what you were thinking when you were 16 or 22, thinking someday I'm going to get married and I'm just going to have the kids and they're going to be like the president and they're going to be the Supreme Court Chief Justice and they're going to eradicate cancer and they're going to... And then this monster shows up and you're just like, God, what in the... Okay, so we're going to be talking about that. Now, there's a lot of theories on parenting today, and I'm being serious here. Uh, do you remember in the 60s, there emerged a guru on parenting. His name was Dr. Benjamin Spock. Many of you probably recall Dr. Benjamin Spock. Uh, I read his stuff. 
uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I will tell you this, before he died, Dr. Spock publicly renounced and recanted his, my words, not his, nonsense. He recanted his teachings, which almost two generations of American parents uh, almost looked at, at Benjamin Spock as like biblical counsel on parenting, right? There are many new theories on parenting. There's actually one out, true story, called attachment parenting. I don't know if you're familiar with attachment parenting. There are three important tenets to attachment parenting. Number one, breastfeed the child into toddlerhood. I don't really know what to say about that. <laughs> I'm not the right gender to know all the implications of that, but I can just simply say, wow, so if the kid's seven and it's lunchtime, you know, there goes the mother. <laughs> Get away from me. Okay. Secondly, the second tenet is co-sleeping with parents. Now, I don't know how you do your life. I mean, as long as the kid wants to. I don't want my 14-year-old in bed with me and Carrie. Do you want your 14-year-old? I don't want my four-year-old in bed. I want to sleep in bed. I want to be with my wife in bed. I don't want kids in bed. But that's a core tenet of attachment parenting. There's a, the third tenet, and it's called baby wearing. And actually, they make these sling-type implements that the mother, and some mothers are kind of petite, that the mother attaches the child for the first multiple years of the child's life physically to the front of their body so that the child can like hear the mother's heartbeat and the mother's breathing and, and I guess bonding happens that way and so forth. And so baby wearing in a sling. Um, I don't know what to say about that either. What I, what I do honor, and I think you probably do too on a, attachment parenting, is the idea of tender, encouraging, nurturing, touching, affection, affirmation. That is important. I don't think you need to do attachment parenting to do that, but whatever floats your boat, sweetheart. So that is one of the big theories out there today. Now, I'm gonna say something right now that is utterly biblical and will change your marriage, change your home, and change your parenting. I'm just gonna mention the biblical principle to you now. We'll really explore it together weekend two and weekend three, okay? God intends for our homes when we have children to be marriage-centered, not child-centered. You say, why is that such a big deal? Because it is a, it, it is a total decider of what's the focal point of the home. To have a marriage-centered home does not mean, I'm not implying, nor is the word of God, that you neglect your children, you're indifferent to your children, you're careless with your children. No, no. It simply means that you don't worship your children as idols and all the energy of the family, all the emotion of the family, all the activity of the family, all the finance of the family is focused on the altar of an eight-year-old. So this won't always happen, but I would suggest if that's the way you're choosing to parent, you're very possibly setting your child up to be an entitled little narcissist and anticipate that everybody in life will celebrate the mere fact that he or her walks in the room and shows up and breathes oxygen on any given day. See, when a marriage is the center of the home, nothing could give children more security. When there is marital love, and where there is love toward the children and limits, you need love and limits, one without the other, is a very uh, potentially painful imbalance. When there's love between the mother and the father, nothing can give the children a better sense of, my home is a good place to be. I like being home. I like my mom, I like my dad, I love my father, I love my mother. They're not perfect, sometimes they aggravate me, drive me crazy but they've always been there. They've never changed, and they are showing me how to do marriage. The only way our kids ever see what marriage is supposed to be is by watching us. Where else can they have a marriage laboratory with a ringside luxury box seat than growing up in our house, watching how parents do marriage, watching what love is supposed to look like? How does commitment play out? What do those things mean? What do they look like? A marriage-centered home, not a child-centered home. I love this statement. Somebody said, to have children 
is to forever decide to have your heart go walking along outside your body. See, it's, it's difficult uh, to rear children because there is no perfect parent. Um, I have often felt, as I reflect on my life, I'm in my 50s now, I could have been a way better parent in my 50s and in my 20s. So at 24, I'm a parent. And uh, the first of our four was born. And you know why I wasn't the parent I could be now? It's because I was still figuring out John. I still had my own issues, my own hang-ups, my own, because I came from a very, in some sense, imperfect and unhealthy single parent home and difficult blended family home and all those implications, right? I was still kind of sorting out me, and then all of a sudden, I've got this darling, little dark-haired, green-eyed treasure from heaven that now I'm supposed to be a dad to. It was daunting. I felt overwhelmed. Here's the principle that I want us to build the balance of our time together on, and it's this. The secret to successful parenting is to treat our children like God the Father treats us. I began to understand that principle 30 years ago, and I've never wavered from it. In my investments in my children, and I was a dad that was there, and I had a lot of other opportunities to not be there, I said no to those things, and I'm not setting myself up as a model. It was hard. I gave away some things I wanted to do, would love to have done, but I needed to be home to help my kid with their geometry. I needed to help them with that science experiment kind of thing, you know? Uh, You can pretend to care, but you can't pretend to show up. You're either there or you're not there. And there demonstrates love. And so uh, I want to encourage you by saying three things, okay? Don't, don't forget these things. For those of you that are feeling overwhelmed as parents, I want to say to you that God built our kids to withstand being raised by human beings. Even human beings in their 20s or early 30s or wherever you may be, human beings with all of our shortcomings and all of our inconsistencies, it's always been that way through human history. Your kids are not as fragile and delicate as you think they are. Uh, That's an encouragement. Secondly, I want to tell you, you can be a great parent. Stop thinking that you're a lousy parent. It's self-fulfilling prophecy. If that's the tape recorder going on in your mind, I say to you with the love as a father, stop acting helpless and defeated as a parent. And for goodness sake, stop your whining and say, okay, I'm beginning to understand some things about parenting I've never seen before. I'm going to begin to treat my sons and daughters like God the Father treats me. I'm going to import biblical wisdom into my daily child-rearing strategies, and I am going to invite the help of the Holy Spirit because this is too big for me to do on my own. There's a third encouragement I want to give you, and it's this. Would you agree with me that God the Father is a perfect parent? Yes? Consider, both of his first two children rebelled against him, Adam and Eve. Did you ever think of that? He's the perfect parent, and yet his kids walked away in rebellion. That's because, you know those darling little treasures from heaven at home? They're, they're sinners. Okay, I'm not saying that you say that to them, but just know in your mind, tuck that away. I'm a big fat sinner, and they are a little sinnerling. Okay? <laughs> Understand that sin is a reality, that your children are free volitional creatures. That's what the theologians say. We're created in the image of God, and they will make choices. They're a free moral agent. It's our job to inform their foundations in life and not turn them loose in sin, and empower their way to self-destruction. Okay, three things we need to learn. Fill it out. Number one, if you would, please. We've got to learn to understand our children. What do we mean understand our children? Their style, their temperament, and their personality. If you got more than one kid you got at least two different personality styles, temperaments, gift mix, and the whole thing going on. I bet you every mother in this church has stopped me at some point and said, so Pastor John, we got three kids now. And the first one was like this angel from heaven. I had 12 minutes of labor and the child's come out and has been obeying from the first minute. 
Child number two was like the devil incarnate, okay? <laughs> By the way, when we say that stuff to our kid, what are we putting in the tape recorder of their spirit, the tape recorder of their mind? Look at me. I love strong-willed kids. I see a strong-willed kid and I say, come to Papa. Because here's the deal. If you take a strong-willed kid and you shape that strong will for God, for good, for right, you've created a world changer. Now, I'm not saying placid children or gentle, instructable children are bad. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm simply saying, stop thinking that your child is the devil incarnate and begin to say, whoa, Jesus, you got a good sense of humor. The next 18 years are going to be interesting, but I'm going to win in God. Hallelujah. This kid is destined for greatness. I will not allow this children, this child of mine, to walk off the edge of a cliff. I will be there, and I will be a force of nature with unconditional love, with reasonable God-honoring limits, and I will stay the course. Notice what the Bible says about understanding our children. I'm in Psalm 103. As a father has compassion on his children, and, and we must have great compassion for our kids. So the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Notice, he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we're but dust. Question for you. Do you know how your children are formed? Suggestion. Take a chill pill and stop screaming at your kids. They're working you, by the way. A screaming parent has lost to the kid. Counting parents have lost to the kid. Where'd counting come from? You ask them the first time, and the ask is number three or 10 or whatever you count to. That is, I just said 10, do it. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> stop screaming at your kid and study your kid. Go to school on your kid. Instead of judging the way they are and judging why they do what they do, say, so Lord, I asked you for children. You've given me these, these, these children. Thank you, Jesus. Now, help me understand their uniqueness like you understand my uniqueness. Does God not make allowance and tolerance and strategic adjustment in how he rears each one of us because we're so different, right? So my children, I've got four. One was really pretty much a piece of cake. The other three were all very strong-willed, but two of them were easy to figure out because they were strong-willed in your face. The third strong-willed one was sneaky strong-willed, <laughs> tricky strong-willed. And then she'd look at you with these darling eyes and you just, oh, it's like the Shrek 2 or Shrek 3 when the cat looks at Shrek, Shrek, you know what I'm saying? What was that, Antonio Banderas or whatever? He's just purring, okay. So she'd look at me with those eyes and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna cut her some slack and my wife would pull me aside and say, she looks at you like that, you melt. So I'm just, kid, get over here. I haven't said it. So I just talked to her like this from now on when I had to. <laughs> There's another verse I want you to write down, Proverbs 22. We're still on understanding your child. It says, train a child in the way that he should go. Now, what that's been commonly understood to mean is the right way or the pathway of life or the pathway of righteousness. That's not what Proverbs 22, six means. The word way in the Hebrew means rear a child according to their bent, their uniqueness, the unique package that they are. Uh, we uh, ha had to rear our four children and my mother reared us uh, very uniquely different because we were wildly different in who we intuitively were. Understand your kid's bent, quit blaming God for giving them to you, and whatever you do, don't program their, their play, playback tape recorder in their mind that they're strong-willed, they're a monster, they're horrible, they're the devil incarnate. Why did you ever come into my life? Nothing could do more damage. What does the Bible say? The power of life and death is in the tongue. Are you killing your kids with your mouth? We'll talk about that in the next couple weekends. Okay, number two, we gotta learn to accept our children. You know why? Because God chose them for me. Everybody say that with me. It might be like eating gravel, say it anyhow. You ready? Go. God chose them for me. Say it one more time. God chose them for me. How'd that feel? Not too bad. God did choose them for you. 
Now, let me, let me ask you this question. Are you disappointed with any of your children? Okay, now look at me here. I guarantee you that child knows it. Do you know how many times people have introduced me for the first time? They come from families in this church even. And they'll say, hey, pastor, so yeah, I'm the black sheep you've heard about. What a horrible, wrong mantle to hang on a kid. The power of life and death is in the tongue. Accept our children. Quit being disappointed in our children. And tactically adjust your strategy of creating that kid to be a winner in God. We've got to understand our children. We've got to accept our children. Look at it in Romans 15. Accept one another. That means including our children. Just as Jesus accepted you in order to bring praise to God. Number three, fill it in, would you please? Rearing children to love God is the number one way to evangelize the world. You say, John, why would you bring this up? Because remember I told you in our beginning of our teaching this morning uh, that what's ultimately at stake is our child's soul. And so understand this. Let me tell you what statisticians say about this. That if we as parents do not introduce our children introduce our children to Jesus, by the age of 14, there's only a 4% chance that child, now a teenager, uh, will come to Christ between the ages of 14 and 18, and only a 6% chance that that child will come to Christ for the rest of their lives. What is happening missiologically in terms of global evangelism is the vast revival of Christianity, faith in Jesus Christ around planet Earth is 95% plus among the children of the world, plus among the teenagers of the world. It is a youth, spiritual juggernaut. Little boys and girls and early adolescents are putting their faith in God. We need to make sure that we take care of spiritual business at home. And on a day where we have a couple hundred women at women's retreat, I want to challenge the fathers specifically. Okay, now, by the way, let me just give you a math equation, kind of like those old mathematics uh, story equations. Uh, we have 150, 200 women this weekend at women's retreat, but in average attendance, we'll be down four or 500. What does that tell you? That tells you that somebody's neglecting to take care of spiritual business with the kids. Just a thought. Fathers, I challenge you in terms of the spiritual formation of your sons and daughters to engage, to show up, to be there every day. You can do this. God will help you. If you set your heart on this, you can do this now. What is the great challenge to the time it takes to build a faith foundation for our sons and daughters? Let's be honest here. We're just being as real as can be. I might say a few things right now that you disagree with. I'm okay with that, but will you do me the favor of at least think about what I'm saying and analyze if there are any parallel applications in your own life? Here's what's happened to us as Americans. We're crazy busy. Are you busy? Everybody's busy. We're crazy busy. Um, we, we have all these conveniences to make life more convenient so we have more time on our hands. It's not working. We're insanely busy. Now, let's ask the question, what are we doing in all that busy time? You know what my conclusion is? By and large, the vast majority is good stuff. It's not bad stuff. We're not robbing banks and, you know, starting a world revolt. It's just life. And life is complex and life is busy. So the trick to begin to build a spiritual foundation for your sons and daughters is take a time inventory of your life. No kidding. For one month, even one week, take a time inventory and say, listen, we say we don't have time to have family devotions together in the Word of God. We say that we don't have time to read the Bible at dinner time together after we eat. We say that we don't have time to go to church together as a family. Let's objectively look at how we are spending our time. And then you know what follows? Some hard decisions. Because you're not, it's not out with the bad, in with the good. We're going to have to make an adjustment to downsize some of the good so that only the best remains. Does that make sense? 
Our decisions create our future. Our decisions really inform our children's spiritual formation and their eternal destination. Is that not important enough for us to make some hard decisions? Now, I use this as one example. Uh, so I coached Little League for 12 years. Uh, we had four aggressive, highly active children. Um, and what we had to do is say, hey, kids, we want you to play sports. One. One what, Dad? One sport. You each get one sport. You can't all play four sports a year because your mom and I will hate each other. We'll get a divorce. You'll be foster children. You'll never see us again. So <laughs> one sport. You got one pick. So kid, you know your daddy loves you, right? Make it a good pick. And then we showed up. And we were present and we were engaged. I remember their coaches, and this was becoming really common. Our first child, our children were born between 85 and 95. Uh, always practices and games on Sundays and Saturdays and Wednesdays. And, and I would call each time, my kids hated this. Ask me if I cared. I would very respectfully call their coach. Because I appreciated that coach in whatever sport that was. Uh, taking the time to invest in my child athletically and relationally and so. And I'd say, uh, Coach Thompson, whoever, I'm just making this up. So my name's John, and I'm this kid's dad. And so they just gave me the schedule. We're going over to a family kind of calendaring, and I noticed that you have seven games on Sundays uh, for this season and about 12 practices. On the, you know, And I want, I want to say to you respectfully um, that my child will not be there on those days. And... Uh, and I'd get all the way from shock and silence, couldn't believe a parent stupid enough to be saying this, to anger, to argument, to whatever, and I'd just stay chill and cool. And I'd say, listen, uh, this is just a, these are our core values as a family, and I wouldn't even recite what the core values are, but they just will not be able to be there because actually we really value athletics for our children, but we have some higher priorities as well. And so they'll be able to participate in these games, not participate in these games. And if you decide you need to bench them or play them less, we understand that. You know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. That's life. Can't have it both ways, one or the other. Okay, my kids early on were mad at me. Honestly, I didn't care. I'd let them get over their mad for a day. And I was always cool with my kids being angry. Not disrespectful, but angry. And then the next day, when cooler minds prevailed, we'd have a heart-to-heart, -heart, okay? Ask my adult children today if they're glad I did that. Ask your children down the road, fathers and mothers, if they're glad that you took a stand on principle without being an obnoxious religious freak. Just these are the principles that we live by. So sorry we can't engage. Thank you for your investment in my child, okay? Don't write me emails because I'm not gonna change my mind. Now, let me just say to you in terms of youth sports, okay? I'm not on a tangent here. I love sports. I cannot wait for June 1st when we get another crack at LeBron. That's what I'm saying. Anyhow, <laughs> I wanna say to you, moms and dads that have your kids in youth sports, get a grip. Your kid ain't gonna make it to the bigs. So begin to invest in your children's sports experiences and make them appreciate team and exercise and competition and fresh air and friends and all those important things. But quit putting incredible pressure on them. Don't live out your disappointing uh, sports failures as a child through your nine-year-old. They're just a kid. Let them have fun. Let them enjoy playing a game. Don't sell their soul for sports or any other activity. And none of these activities activities are in inherently bad, they only become a drag. They only become a distraction when there's no spiritual investment in the children. And then the kid turns 15 and 16, and we wonder why they're having sex, we wonder why they're doing drugs, we wonder why they're sexting, we wonder why, you know, and we say, well, where did this happen? I'm convinced, raise a child. Train a child, the word of God says, in the way that they should go from infancy. Be present, be there, love them unconditionally and completely and set limits. My child, this is who we are. This is what this family's about. Okay? Bible says, do not withhold discipline from a child. If you withhold discipline, he will die. Discipline him or her and save his soul from death. Do not read 
only spanking or only physical discipline. The Bible's speaking about a holistic discipline structure to life. Here's another one. It's Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Now, I'm aware enough to know that almost everything I've said to the current second is politically incorrect. I know I am like a fruit loose loop in modern parenting, etc. But I can demonstrate how everything that I'm talking about comes from the Word of God. And here's the question that we have to answer as parents here it is Does truth change because we as a people have changed? Does truth change because we've changed? I'm not making a plea for the good old days because the good old days are the good old days because of a bad memory. I am making a plea that we inform our parenting with the wisdom of the word of God, that we treat our children the way God the Father treats us. I have six transformational principles. Don't panic. We're only gonna do one this morning and then we wrap. We'll do the other five in the next two weekends. Here it is. Fill it in. It'll change your life. The goal of discipline is to help our children associate pain with wrongdoing and thus help them go to heaven. I want to be crystal clear by saying this word discipline, again, is not talking only about physical discipline or spanking or anything like that. Uh, I want to be very clear that there is never any case any set of circumstances in any context at any time where any kind of harsh, heavy-handed violence or abuse against a child is justified. It is not, it never will be, it is wrong, and it is sin. Okay, I want to be very clear so that we, because a lot of people see this and they, they misunderstand the word of God and they start wailing on their kids. That does not have anything to do with the heart of the father. Correcting their character does, but not any form of abuse. So what is discipline? The Bible teaches discipline is pain with the purpose. What is the fruit of that pain? Here it is, the building of character. Do you want sons and daughters of virtue. Do you want sons and daughters that when your hair turns gray, and it will, just have some kids, when your hair turns gray, you can look back and say, my sons are men of virtue. My daughters are women of virtue. I'm not talking about what they do, how much money they make. I'm talking about their soul. What do we want to be saying about our children? We need to teach them that S-I-N exists. There is sin. There is wrong. There is right. There is evil. There is good. I know that's politically incorrect. I'm cool with that. I'm sticking with the book. And how we do that in little ways with our children, we're not preaching to them theologically, but we're helping them understand that these are the boundaries and the limits in our home. Son, what I'm trying to do is build character in your heart to do the right that will give you a life of blessing. If we do not do this, we encourage our children to rebel against us today and to rebel against God tomorrow. Listen to Dr. Grace Ketterman. She says, permissiveness by a parent is not an act of love. Permissiveness is neglect. It doesn't produce strong, creative, emotionally healthy children. Children need limits, and limits are a requirement for emotional growth. They imply concern for the child's well-being because when a parent fails to set limits, children will continue to test you until they meet resistance. Dr. Larry Christensen the child who has everything done for him, everything given to him, and nothing required of him is a deprived child. The parent who tries to please the child by giving in to him and expecting nothing ends up pleasing no one, least of all that child. For in the end, when trouble results, the child will blame the parent for gutlessness. Remember this truth that what one generation tolerates, so we the parents of this generation, as it were, what one generation tolerates in moderation, the next generation will live in excess. 
Don't worry that your children aren't listening to you. Worry that they're watching you. Worry that they will, in fact, emulate our behavior, good, bad, and otherwise. So discipline today leads our children, watch this, to a lifetime of self-discipline. Get your kids out of bed. Don't let them sleep till noon because they're not gonna be able to do that when they're 25. They're gonna have to get up at 4.30 or 5 a.m. and go to work, support a family, drive the speed limit, pay their taxes, tithe, worship God, serve the poor. Why will they do those things? Because they are right in the eyes of the Lord. And right is right no matter who's against it. And wrong is wrong no matter who's for it. My child, heed the words of your father, of your mother. Too many parents are worried about upsetting their children. I think we ought to be worried about upsetting God. I close with this. So... If there's any geographical place where I think my kids have a shot at going to heaven, it's got to be the laundry room. Because that was at the farthest reach of the house where we could have a come to Jesus meeting and nobody else would hear the goings ons. And so, and by the way, honestly, we were not a ranting, raving, yelling, screaming, out of control. When, when you do that, you've already lost. You're out of control. And by the way, out of control parents produce out of control kids. You know why that kid's throwing a t- can't tantrum? He learned it somewhere. Okay, that's another sermon. Now, so, it's getting very quiet in here. How many times my children's challenged my authority? And by the way, they really challenged their mother's authority, uh, especially my sons. Those were, those were, I had one tough, very direct conversation with my boys, no physical anything, where I sent a message, she is the queen of this home. Don't you ever speak to her like that again. Do you understand me? And, we, and boom, after that, they were cured. Because I've told my son now that they're adult men, when I die and go home to heaven, which I thought might happen last year, I want you to make sure your mother never has one day of want. You treasure her, you revere her, you honor her, you love her. Even though you no longer live in her home, you make sure your mother never has one day of want for care or your love. How do they learn that? By laundry room conversations at 11 p.m. with a 16-year-old, that's how. So there are many times my kids would challenge what Carrie or I were asking them to do. And I would, this is how our conversations would go. Now listen, this is gonna help you. I'd say to him, now listen. And I'd always listen to my kid, and I was fine if they were angry, but not disrespectful. I'd say, listen, I know you don't want to do that thing that we're asking you to do. Or I know that you don't want to stop doing that thing that we're asking you to stop doing. I understand that. But I'm the parent, and I'm deciding for you today. Stop doing that, or start doing that. My child, one day, and one day soon, it will be your job to decide for you. Today it's my job, and today is not the day for you to decide. That day will yet come. Are we crystal clear? I am being a good parent right now, as angry as you are at me. Now, go clean up your room and get ready for supper. See, that's the kind of courage that we need to have to stand our children down because they will challenge you. And it doesn't involve violence or abuse or screaming and and carrying on and hurling lamps. It involves parents who are Christ-centered and biblical wisdom-centered about their parenting where I will treat my children like God the Father treats me because their eternity is at stake and my legacy at stake. In Jesus' name, and everyone said...